Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our last section of surgery, transplant and post-operative care. Now when it comes to transplant surgery, the U.S. Assembly Step 2 primarily wants to know, do you know the major types of transplants that are tested? What are their indications and what are the most common complications? So let's begin with liver transplant. The most common indications for liver transplant are acute hepatic failure and severely worsening chronic liver disease with an elevated MELD score. The complications that can occur from this, number one is post-operative bleeding, and then long complications can be biliary strictures. Now why do these biliary strictures occur after the transplant? It's because of ischemia to the graft. Kidney transplants can also be done because of end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis or PCKD. The most common complication here is there's a urine leak because of poor distal blood supply to the distal ureter. Pancreatic transplants are done because of type 1 diabetes and the more common complications here because it's such a difficult organ to work with is rejection and then of course loss of graft function even if it does take. Small bowel transplants most commonly are all due to some type of insult to the person's intestines and so they develop things like Crohn's disease or they've had severe gunshot trauma and then they develop subsequent shortcut syndrome and the complication with the small bowel transplant is graft failure and rejection. A 57 year old woman undergoes emergent cholecystectomy for perforated gallbladder three days ago. Now she's got a fever, post-op fever, post-op fever, and she is not ambulating. There's pain at the incision. What is the most common cause of fever in this patient? The answer, urinary tract infection. Now you need to know post-op fever and you've been memorizing these mnemonics. So let's go over it together. You've got your post-op days, one through two, three, five, five, six, seven, and then outward of two weeks after surgery. During days one to two, the most common reasons for post-op fever is atelectasis and pneumonia. In these patients, you wanna get a chest x-ray and consider a sputum culture if pneumonia is actually suspected. Give them an incentive spirometer, antibiotics like Svank and Cefepime. Days three to five, a urinary tract infection is most common. In these patients, you wanna do a urine analysis and then consider starting antibiotics if they're leukocyte esterase, but they also have pyuria or white cells. The best way to prevent a urinary tract infection on days three to five is get the urinary catheter, the Foley catheter out earlier. Days five to six is actually classically going to be a thrombophobitis, which is from an IV site infection or a DVT. In these patients, you wanna go ahead and consider using Doppler ultrasound. You can use low molecular weight heparin or a NOAC, a novel anticoagulant, and of course, replace the IVs. Day seven is the critical one. Notice so far, none of these have to do with the actual incision site. Day seven is when the incision site becomes an issue. You get cellulitis around the area, you're gonna diagnose this by doing a physical exam. You're gonna look for erythema, pus, and swelling. The way you're gonna handle this, you're gonna consider that there could be an abscess underneath, so you're gonna do an incision and drainage and start antibiotics. Days eight to 15 is when drug reaction and deep abscess become an issue. <clears throat> if you're considering it to be a drug reaction, stop the offending agent and do a CAT scan to look for the deep abscess. And if there is one, drain it. So that's day one to two is wind, Day three to five is water. Days five to six is walking. Day seven is the wound itself. And day eight to 15 changes. Some of you say weird, some of you say wonder, it doesn't matter. Moving on to the post-op period, there are other complications. What is the most common post-op complications? Actually gonna be confusion. Confusion, confusion, I'm confused, you're confused. But the post-op patient's confused for two reasons most commonly being hypoxia or sepsis. In these patients, you wanna get an ABG, a chest X-ray. You wanna consider getting blood cultures and a urine analysis. Empiric antibiotics should be started if there's fever and hypotension. And if they're hypoxic, you wanna consider a PE, atelectasis, or pneumonia. And so for the post-op confused patient, you're gonna run through the algorithm like this. After you have a confused patient in front of you, get the ABG, chest X-ray, and CBC. If there's evidence of hypoxia, there's gonna be an abnormal ABG. In these patients, you're next gonna look at the chest X-ray. If there's changes, you're gonna look for things like atelectasis and pneumonia, hook him up with this incentive spirometer, get that chest X-ray read properly and start some antibiotics. If there's no changes on the chest X-ray, consider PE for spiral CT. If there is an evidence of an infection, possibly an abnormal CBC, go ahead and look at the culture sites, blood, 
and urine analysis. And you may even have to consider looking at um, other sources of infection as well, and you're gonna treat with empiric antibiotics. Post-op patients can also develop ARDS, and these can happen, and they can present with severe hypoxia, tachypnea, and accessory muscle use. How do you diagnose them? Good, you're gonna get a chest x-ray that's gonna show bilateral pulmonary infiltrates that fluffy and are gonna be the uh, top corners and bottom corners, or the bat wing pattern. And you're gonna see JVD, you're gonna to wanna to rule out CHF, and then treat with positive end expiratory pressure. Now pulmonary embolus can occur in the post-op period. They're gonna present with the acute onset of dyspnea, and what's your chest exam gonna be like? Clear. The best initial test is gonna be an EKG and chest x-ray that's gonna show sinus tachycardia with non-specific ST segment changes. You're gonna confirm this with a CT angio of the chest, and you're gonna treat with low molecular weight heparin or one of the novel anticoagulants. <clears throat> If the patient has a PE while on the anticoagulant you use, you go ahead and place an IBC filter. Keep in mind, the most common EKG finding for PE is nonspecific ST changes. S1Q3T3 is not the most common. A 62-year-old woman gets a hip replacement three days ago. 30 minutes ago, she reports moderate shortness of breath, chest pain with inspiration. What is your next step gonna be? Now, this is some test taking strategy for you. EKGs own all the choices, so EKGs definitely right. And you're suspecting that acute onset of pain and tachypnea and shortness of breath. You're worried about a PE, she's post-op, she's high risk, spiral CT scan. Now, some patients who have had abdominal surgeries, bariatric surgeries can develop dumping syndrome. There's two types, early and late. The symptoms can be hypotension that's postprandial with an autonomic response of flushing, tachycardia, and possible syncope. The high tonic food load hits the intestines too quickly and it's not digested properly and so it pulls water from the vascular space and so therefore they get rapid emptying of hyperosmolar fluid, excuse me, food that causes fluid shifts from the plasma into the bowel and the treatment for this is going to be small frequent meals and small food that's separated from liquids by 30 minutes because the liquids move through quickly so solid foods go first, liquids go 30 minutes later. Now, late onset dumping syndrome is also known as postprandial hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. These patients are going to be hypoglycemic, dizzy, fatigue, have diaphoresis and weakness. The cause of this actually is most commonly a specific type of bariatric surgery. That's right, if you said ruin why gastric bypass, you're correct. The symptoms begin usually when? That's right, several months after surgery. And how many hours after having a high carbohydrate meal? one to three hours. The treatment for these patients is just like with dumping syndrome, small, frequent, manageable meals, separate the liquids and solids by 30 minutes. If these fail, start octreotide. Now, why octreotide? Good, because it slows down the gut and allows things to be absorbed properly. Now, post-op ileus is basically obstipation and intolerance of oral intake following surgery. It's like they have an obstruction, but there's no actual physical change. It's just that the gut is sluggish. Most common causes are electrolyte abnormalities, prolonged surgery, sepsis, and perioperative opiate use. The best initial test, just like in a person with obstruction, get an abdominal x-ray showing air fluid levels. The most accurate test, good, it's a CT scan. What is the treatment of choice? That's right. Take care of the underlying problems, remove the offending agents, fix the electrolytes, and of course, supportive care. Now, post-cardiac surgery syndrome is a type of pericarditis that occurs with or without an effusion after an injury to the pericardium. It classically can occur with surgeries. It presents with tachycardia, tachypnea, and distant muffled heart sounds. What will the chest x-ray show? Cardiomegaly. The best initial test is gonna be EKG. The most accurate, good, echocardiogram. And how do you prevent it? Excellent, you're gonna use colchicine after surgery, and if they don't get prevented, then you're gonna treat it with NSAIDs and colchicine. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of transplant and post-op care and the end of surgery. Thanks for joining me. I had a great time. I'm pretty sure you did too.